Uh, okay. Thanks for joining me here. I'm Philip Bogarts. I'm working for RV Networks um, since a few months. And actually, I've been pretty busy in load balancing space for the last 15 years. So it was a change. And it was really interesting to see how applications have been developing, the architecture has been evolving, and how load balancing actually fits into this story. So if you try to figure out who I am, feel free uh, to reach out. So, when they asked me to talk here in front of OpenStack, it was pretty new to me. And when I first delved into the environment, I saw that a lot of big names and logos are actually using OpenStack in production. And what struck me was that most of these customers were actually talking to because they still need to solve some uh, very nasty uh, issues before they can actually go into production. And that's actually why load balancing, load balancing as a service, availability, scaling are such a huge um, thing to take a look at. Last survey we actually looked at was that performance of a cloud is still very important. We try to put together everything, we try to reuse CPUs, memory and so on and so forth. But CPU only and memory only is not an indication really, or disk out for that matter, if an application is really performing all well. There's still the entire networking. And basically at the end of the day, it's user experience. If you deploy a new web app, the only thing you're measured on is whether these customers stay on the website and have a very lean um, performance and the end user experience. And so performance and security, for that matter, are a very important aspect when you deploy next generation type of applications. So to live up to the promise of software-defined principles and web skill principles, where you can actually deploy and automate things, have multi-tenancy and stuff like this, um, we also need to actually come up with a very good approach, good architecture, a good set of tools to actually deliver on the enterprise grade application services. Application services, I mean load balancing, security, there's a zero fault, there is seven switching, and so on and so forth. So there is seven based load balancing functionality. It's a zero of fault are things which are not going away. It's not because you move to cloud that you don't need load balancing anymore. On the contrary, Load balancing becomes even more important. We see migrations going from standard apps to containerized apps. Nearly everything needs to be scaled bound and load balanced. So that's actually the reason why Avi actually started in this space to provide load balancing and security services in cloud-like platforms. So why are the new load balancer? Because there are quite a lot of them in the market. First of all, if we look at the open source tooling, which is available for load balancing, for example, Nginx or HAProxy, which is uh, basically packaged with OpenStack, these are very good tools. They're robust, they're stable, but sometimes we need more advanced functionality like SSL offloading, in that new types of certificates, higher key lengths, there is seven routing, stuff like this. So, that's typically why there is a reason why you would move to what we call legacy type of applying solutions, load balancing based on hardware. And quite often they offer all the tooling and way more than you actually would need. The problem is, if you want to integrate legacy load balancing equipment within a cloud, you run against a lot of issues because it typically doesn't run the cloud, it actually sits beside it. It's not because something is running a VM, it can actually uh, do cloud-based uh, cloud um, type of functionality. So that's actually the reason why we actually came up with a new solution. If you look at today's workloads and apps, they're still, I've heard the word 10 times today, running on bare metal probably, or in VMs, and more and more a type of container kind of environments where they are public or private cloud. In any type of these uh, solutions, 
because your app can live everywhere and needs to be able to migrate from any place to anywhere, you basically need these services across the entire uh, type of architectures. Not to speak from the way apps are being deployed, not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping, but we see these big monolithic apps, which are still there, yeah? uh, move to multi-tier apps, where, for example, your database, your web tier, your middle tier is already separated, to go to microservices, where you basically have container services, which is a very piece, small container, basically, which does a very specific task, and these container services actually block the container services. I've seen multiple demos today where they actually do a scale-out of a web application by simply typing Docker uh, compose scale to 5 to 20 nodes. But it's not because you can actually scale out applications. It's not a matter of adding one and suddenly go to 10 web servers. These 10 web servers need to be available. We need to be sure they are accessible, we need to make sure they get as a zero flaw. So it introduces a lot of challenges we need to address. So the solution at Avi is basically a distributed architecture, it's basically a low balancer that can actually run in all these kind of environments. Where it is as open stack, where it is DCOS, where it is as Docker. So basically we have a uniform small footprint, load balancing and security instance that I can actually run everywhere where you potentially might need it. On top, this is all centrally managed, that means that if you need to integrate all these kind of tiny load balancers into a cloud, well, there's a centralized management platform, which is basically one instance or a cluster of an instance or a Docker container for that matter, which actually talks to all the other ecosystems. So, it's truly living up to the promise of software-defined application services where you have, first of all, a data plane which takes care of all the things you need while your apps become faster. And on the other hand, you have a control plane which integrates with, for example, OpenStack. That means that if you deploy something in OpenStack, you can actually pick up all that deployment. The moment you push that button to deploy the app, actually pick up on the configuration and do the load balancing for you. So you can see there's a pretty broad spectrum of applications and tooling that can actually work in coexistence with the solution. This is simply because of one fact. It's an open API. You can actually go to it on GitHub and take a look at it. So what do we add on top of these uh, tools? is first of all, what you might expect from an enterprise grade load balancing, meaning HTTP, HTTPS, TCP load balancing, in-depth health checks and stuff like this. Other things like content switching, caching, compression, all these kind of scenarios. So these are important, I need, these are important first of all because your apps will need it, second because you need to offload it, and last but not least, it will guarantee you a very good end-user experience. That's what, why you need to call application delivery controls. How do you actually go along with scaling? If you deploy an app, it's running on two web servers. Why would you need very high capacity load balancing? It just takes resources. It's sitting there. So, the load balancer itself, once it's deployed, actually also lives up to these web scale principles. You can actually start out with a small load balancer. If your app needs to scale out, you can actually scale out very easily the load balancer. It's fully automatic. Even in OpenStack, it's a matter of clicking a button or launch an API call or a policy for that matter, and it will do it uh, for you. The security part, of course, your web apps and I've been working in web application security space for a very long time. Um, your web apps don't get more secure. The way you develop apps isn't really different in how apps and code is written in the past. So the security part is still a very important factor. Not to mention SSL, web application, all these things 
are a bare necessity when you actually deploy a web apps. DDoS protection is another very important thing which is gaining a lot of attention. Uh, quite often we get involved with customers and their sole and only problem is that their web apps or the business is on relying is highly critical new type of web apps are simply attacked. So you need tools to actually accommodate and that's basically the main difference because of a simple tool that does what it is up to up to enterprise grade and type of functionality. Something we added, but this is more to containers. But I learned today that a lot of container deployments or Kubernetes or TCOS for that matter is actually living inside OpenStack. Um, also introduces another big security issue because these containers they live somewhere on these hosts. There's very little protection between these containers to talk to each other. A load balancer, for that matter, is actually sitting between these containers. And it can actually learn automatically which containers are talking to which containers. So it can actually turn on what we would call micro-segmentation, not between VMs, actually between containers. So it's a very unique feature and it's basically built in in how the product works within our cloud. As I said, end-user experience is very, very important. You might have the biggest cloud, the fastest machines, but if an app is slow, there might be a lot of reasons. As I said, it can be CPU, it can be memory, it can be disk I.O., but it can be latency, it can be the network in the data center, it can be the virtual network, it can be the internet connection, related to location, related to device, iPhones are slow, for that matter. So, what we added on top of that is that we actually do a lot of analytics and visibility. Since we actually separated the entire data processing part from the analytics, these analytics are living on the controller. If you need a lot of analytics, just get out the controller and it will give you an in-depth view of how an application is actually living. Based on these informations, if you, for example, would see that app latency would increase, well, we can actually talk to OpenStack or talk to Docker or talk to DCOS for that matter and actually ask to scale out the web apps until the situation is back to where you really expect it to be. As I said, it's fully centralized managed, full REST API, and multi tenant because that's really a uh, basic uh, requirement. So how does it work technically? The only thing you need to do, I'll take the OpenStack example, is actually deploy QCAL within OpenStack. Uh, basically, it's a controller. The moment this controller is up and running, you actually give it credentials to go to Keystone. And that's it. At that moment, the controller will learn everything it actually needs to learn about the environment. And the moment you actually use LBAS as a service, for example, to deploy an app, it will actually do all these things for you. It will deploy the load ones where you actually need it, put it in the right networks, and actually deploy the config. As I said, the controller can do that in bare metal, can do that in VMs. You can actually do that also in containers or in public cloud. We have cloud connectors so that OpenStack team, sorry, if a controller would actually be sitting outside of OpenStack, you can actually talk to OpenStack to do this kind of stuff. So the controller can really be a hybrid cloud uh, tool that can actually uh, take care of that. The moment these load balancers are deployed, as I said, they set out the metrics and the controller will do all these uh, nice graphing and trending. So briefly, how does it work in OpenStack? So as I said, you simply deploy the controller. Controller will actually has a REST API or a user interface. It will actually talk to Keystone to import all the roles, tenant information, and so on and so on. So all this information is pulled out. And the moment somebody through means of our REST API or through means of Horizon, for example, um, deploys 
a load balancing, it will actually go talk to Nova to deploy the nodes or the, the service engines we call them. We'll do all the networking for you. We actually place it automatically in the networks. And we can actually pick up an IP address automatically. And for some customers, we even register that IP address in DNS. So that is really a, a very easy way to deploy load balancing with all the hassle of configuring VLANs and stuff, and stuff like this. So there are about two modes. Uh, basically, how you can install it, as I said, or three modes. You can actually have it outside of OpenStack. Yeah. Or you can actually deploy it in this kind of scenario, where you basically have a provided tenant, which is has it actually doing all the load balancing and analytics. You manage it. If you need the load balancing, you actually deploy it on that. But on the other hand, you can also deploy it like this, where you have an admin tenant, where actually your OpenStack is talking to, your APIs are talking to, and we can actually deploy the load balances into the tenants. As I said, it's multi-tenant, which basically means if somebody would log in on a certain tenant, he would only see his own config, and it's also the only thing he will be able to change. It's all the same controller, and it will do that all automatically for you. One of the last slides, and then I'll jump into the demo to show you a few things, is a very neat functionality is autoscale. As I said, we continuously measure how apps behave. And for example, if we would detect that the load balancing engines are, let's say, underscaled, we get an immense hit on SSL, we need more CPU. At that moment, our controller will be aware of that and can actually instruct OpenStack to actually spin out extra load balances. In this case, these four load balances act as one big scalable load balance. The load, as a zone, is increasing anymore, and you need resources for something else, think for example in Amazon, yeah. you can actually take away these load balances gracefully not by uh, exploding them, um, so that we go back to the original. Something we will add pretty soon, um, in a matter of a few days, is that we'll be able to do predictive autoscaling. So we'll actually try to figure out the trends, when does your peak traffic occurs, once in a day, once in a week, in the weekends, so that we can actually proactively scale out the environment, and when we don't need the performance anymore, scale back in, totally automatic. If one of the nodes fails, imagine that a node uh, goes down, or that one of the load balances, for whatever reason, would crash, the controller is totally aware of the situation, and will talk immediately back to OpenStack, and actually restore the cluster as how you define your SLA for that matter. This is how we're scaling the load balances. But we're also measuring how the app is performing. So we have a fairly good idea on what the app performance is, what the throughput is, what the app response time is. Based on that information, which is something you don't get out of the CPU and memory, so really in-depth HTTP related information, you can actually use that information by means of a auto-scaling policy. You can actually say, okay, sorry. Yeah. Talk to our controller, tell our controller, or control, sorry, our controller will know that we need more resources. You can actually go to OpenStack or through means of heat or something else, and actually ask to scale the app. Once an app is scaled out, our controller will pick up on it and add a new nodes, uh, technically, to the uh, cluster. I have a few backup plans slides, simply because of uh, network reliability, so I'll go to this part. 
we can see it. So basically, this is a controller which is actually deployed in OpenStack. So you can see it's multi-tenant. It actually took all these tenants, which you can see on the left for me, uh, pulled them out of Keystone, so I can actually see which services were actually deployed in the low pass. I've never touched this controller. It's just there because I just wanted to figure out what it's done. Basically, this entire config is actually done through means of the Elbus drivers, the Elbus plugins we have made for OpenStack. So the moment somebody deploys through means of Elbus a service, just configure it here, and the driver will actually push it to the law masks. Of course, this is Elbus. It will give you the features it promise you. Yeah. When you're using Elbus version 1 or shortly Elbus version 2, you will get some extra functionality. But at the end, there can be much more to it than just the functionality offered by Elbus. But one scenario is that you use Elbus, so you're actually not relying on a separate API uh, for that. What we added is the ability to actually see the statistics in, um, in the Horizon View Manager. I can actually go into this VIP and you will actually see how this app is behaving. I'll use another app to show you more in the um, but this is actually what you get. You never touched RV. The only thing you did was actually install the controller and made it point to Keystone. If you want to use Elbus, you can. It will continue to work. If you need specialized functionality, you can actually go and actually also deploy, instead of through means of Elbus, directly on the controller. Again, we're still linked to OpenStack. So if I would create a service over here, and I'll switch to the right tenant. Let me log in. Second. And I would go to So if I would create a little master, right now I'm using the API of the controller itself. You will see that the moment I create one, even when I use basic setup, that I can actually take things. And this information is actually now being pulled out of the OpenStack environment. So you need the networks and basically say, okay, deploy it in this network and can basically go in and also ask him, show me all the VMs which are deployed in which networks. And I took the wrong. But as you can see, I'm in the wrong uh, tenant apparently, but it actually takes the VMs which are available in the tenant to make it easy. If I go over here, you can actually see this. If I would go to network topology, you can actually see when it loads. So where the load balancer is, so this is our load balancer, and these are actually the service and the clients which are generating the traffic. This is all through means of full integration. Now, I have some five minutes left. I'll show you a few other capabilities which can make your life very easy when it comes down to understanding when an application is really working as it is expected. As I said, it's not only CPU, memory, and disk. So, an application which is deployed from means of this solution, as I've shown you, we actually gather all the statistics. And we do a lot of number crushing on it. So basically, if you look here on the right, you can actually see that things seem to be okay. You get all the information as you would need, connections are open and pretty low. 
but if you pay attention, you actually see that the system detected that the app is responding, but that we have quite some errors on the request level, not even on the connection level. Yeah. So, the moment this gets my attention, and it can trigger an alert so that I get an SMS or whatever, I can actually go into the logs, and I opened them already here. Um, let me refresh that page quickly. So, this moment actually, I'm seeing all the errors which were actually detected by the controller. This can be network, application related, whatever. If I would actually ask him to show me also all the logging related to traffic, which is okay, it's actually won't work. So at this moment, I'm actually looking at a bunch of logging information, which is all indexed and analyzed for me. So, they were trying to figure out what's actually the problem I have with these requests. I can actually ask the system to show me a break off of how this looks. It will actually tell me that about, much is it, 97% is okay, but about 3% is actually resulting in errors. Anything which is in blue, I can actually filter it on. And I can do the same operation, and it will actually tell me that these are 404s, or 4XX. So, right now, I'm actually digging out of, I think, 70,000 blocks. Um, and I know this amount of errors is basically related to response codes. So you can see, most of them are related to 404. Again, if I try to figure out what server, what application is causing this error, I can actually simply ask this system to show me all the URLs that actually cause this uh, mistake. So it's a missing image somewhere. And I can actually figure out pretty easily also on which backend server. If I had more time, I would show you what this application is actually Layer 7 based content switching with about 10 nodes behind it. So it really pinpoints whatever you have on one place. I have a minute left, so I can show you something else which is pretty intriguing. And we have an application over here. We call it Scale Out because we're going to scale it out. Uh, and if I would look at it again, I can see that end-to-end -end timing is okay and stuff like this. But basically this time, I'm seeing a pretty high percentage of failed connections. I could actually go into the logs, try to figure out what's wrong. Actually, you will see that if I do that, I can actually figure out fairly easily that this load balancer, this one, is actually being hit by one to two gig of SSL traffic, and so on and so on. If it opens. Yeah. I'm handling about one to two gig, I'm handling five, six hundred, uh, how much is it? Hitting maximum CPU. Yeah. It's one vCPU on one gig RAM. So the performance is pretty okay, but at the end you'll see that we have some errors. So to solve this error, I would have been alerted already 20 times, because I can fairly easily put a threshold on uh, how much CPU we can actually tolerate. I could actually go into this application, automatically or manually hit the scale out button, and what will happen right now is it's actually talking to it. What happened is we deployed a second load balancer in a matter of a few seconds. It's sitting the same networks. It's handling half of the traffic right now. If the problem wouldn't be solved at this moment, I could fairly easily do exactly the same thing and put a third load balancer into the game. 
As I said, this is fully orchestrated, there is no magic behind it, and it can be done fully automatically. Based on all the metrics we gather, I have shown it on the low ones, so we can do basically do the same on applications. It's my story. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask. I will be around for the rest of the day, so feel free uh, to pass by. Thank you.